Okay, so as a reminder, we talked about a couple different examples, then the definitions, talk about Pleistocene extinction. We've been talking about fisheries and whaling as one example. A couple ideas there that we talked about. Boom and bust, a serial depletion, moving from one thing to another. And then the one thing we haven't talked about yet um, they want to touch on is this idea of fishing down the food web, which came from fisheries. Came from fisheries, but it applies to a bunch of different things. So, okay, so there we go. So, that, so that this is a reminder of what we're doing, and we're just going to wrap up this stuff right now. Okay, so here's a little quick uh, introduction. So, these are starting out. Taken now, there is a massive cloud of bacteria. That is what's going on in the ocean. That is the rise of science. Okay, so rise of slime. So, so this is another example of essentially this serial depletion thing we're talking about. So the way um, it's been uh, codified by a guy named Daniel Pauly several years ago and now applied more generally is this idea of fishing down or exploiting down the food web. So we start off harvesting, we start off our, our exploitation with the big, giant, tasty things that we like. The big buffalo, the big tuna, that kind of stuff, right? And then um, just as we saw with whales, once we sort of take out the easy to get, the most desirous, the most tasty, whatever ones, then we go on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And what we see across the world's oceans, for example, is that the size of the fish has shifted. So we used to take a lot of these big-bodied, large-bodied individuals, and then we took all them out. And then we switched to the medium-sized individuals and started taking those individuals out, et cetera. Not only are we fishing down in size, but we're also fishing down, particularly in this context, the trophic level. So we used to take out the top predators, right? And then, you know, the secondary predators. And then we moved to taking out the primary predators and so on and so forth. So now um, we have uh, folks that are harvesting krill, right? Harvesting shrimp that would be, you know, historically the food for other fish, for example. And so so this fishing down the food web is, is an issue, right? Because we're, we're simplifying the complexity of the ocean. We're simplifying the complexity of the forest as we're doing this. And, um, and so that's a consequence of over-exploitation as well. Um, and then let's talk about a couple different examples. We already talked about a few. We talked about whales. We talked about um, uh, uh, dodos. We've talked about um, passenger pigeons. So let's talk about a couple other examples of sort of classic over-exploited species. And one of those would be what, we, what everybody seems to call the buffalo, but are really bison, American bison. Um, and this was, uh, uh, you know, the largest ungulate mammal we had um, in North America. Very, very large-bodied individual. Just like with the passenger pigeons, very high numbers moved in giant aggregations, migrating around the Great Plains. On um, the order of tens of millions of these individuals in the 1850s, now, in the early 1900s, they were almost extinct. So there's various restoration programs now in Colorado and Montana and various places to reestablish these herds. Um, but we're talking now tens of thousands of individuals as opposed to millions and millions of individuals. Um, and so, and this is just one example. This is a guy standing on buffalo skulls, just to give you a scale of the exploitation. Um, just like the passenger pigeons, when they would move, it would just be a, a massive sea of these individuals. Same thing with the buffaloes, right? They would go across the, the grasslands, the great grasslands of the middle part of this country, and just, you know, horizon to horizon sometimes, just these massive, massive herds. Um, and so here you see the original distribution before Europeans started getting involved with them. And then uh, their, their distribution shrunk, 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 shrunk. And now we're left with these relatively small pockets uh, uh, here and there um, where, where folks are actively managing them and actively encouraging them. A lot of this is done um, uh, by Native American tribes that are trying to restore their culture as well as, as, well as just the health ecosystem and all that kind of good stuff. 
Um, uh, there are private efforts as well, um, but, but most of this is, um, is, is still small. Actually, the closest herd you guys can see, maybe you know where the closest bison herd to us is? Catalina Island. So this chunk of, this group of buffalo were brought out there, bison were brought out there for a film, to make a film in the 19, I don't remember, 20s, something like that. And they used them to make a cowboy, you know, cowboys and Indian movie type of stuff. And then when they're done, they just kind of basically let them go. So now that population of buffalo have, 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 are, are there. And uh, when I did my undergrad, I used to be a research diver as an undergrad, and then I did my PhD out of Catalina, we'd sometimes have buffalo walk on the volleyball courts and stuff, mm -hmm. which was kind of cool. Um, anyway, uh, you can you actually, people are trying to make this a viable thing, so you can actually buy um, uh, bison or buffalo burgers now, right, to support these efforts and, and generate money to continue to grow the populations and stuff like that. So, so you f you'll find it in various restaurants sometimes. You'll find a, a bison, uh, usually it's in the form of burgers, but it could be whatever. Okay, then we can talk about the gray wolf. We'll talk more about the gray wolf when we get to talking about the Endangered Species Act. But, um, but this is a um, uh, major predator for us here across much of the U.S. Big story is we don't like predators. Our, our species does not like predators. We see them as a threat to us. And any excuse, we like to attack them. And so um, primarily this began with wolves attacking livestock, sheep, cattle, stuff like that. And then ranchers saying, these guys are evil, let's kill them. So we started this very, very aggressive eradication uh, uh, effort, primarily, I mean, using everything. So they became a bounty, just like the mountain lions, they became a bountied predator. So the government would pay you to bring in evidence that you killed one of these guys. But, uh, and so that was a big problem, but even bigger problem was the poisoning. So strychnine, these other really, really toxic poisons, we'd put out um, uh, poisoned uh, prey items and leave them out. And that, that did a massive number on our, um, uh, on, our, on our coyotes too, but on our wolves. Um, when we sort of exit that in the mid part of the 1900s, we exit that era of saying maybe we shouldn't poison every single last wolf. Um, uh, the remnant populations were in the northern reaches of, of the lower 48 states. And so we began w uh, working on seeing how we could uh, cultivate them and encourage their populations. They come along, they're one of the flagship species when we enact the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1973. Again, more on that later. And then with that level of protection, they began to repopulate. They began to repopulate naturally, and then we helped move different individuals around into different areas. And again, we'll talk about how we did that. Um, but essentially, we stopped the massive over-exploitation of them, right? We stopped the massive over-harvesting of them. Um, one of the biggest successes was the reintroduction of wolves to the Yellow greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And that happens in the 1990s. And they've just been going crazy ever since. They've been doing really, really well. Um, and, uh, and are a great success, conservation success story. So much so that uh, starting in the last decade, um, we've begun to delist different segments or, or, or downlist different segments of the uh, gray wolf population. Again, more on that later, but that's a, that should be considered a conservation success. Um, uh, there was a proposal a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, to delist under uh, the Trump administration to delist all wolves. That that didn't happen, but um, but things have been going pretty well. This is the example of the success of those original 66 wolves. They've gone uh, uh, crazy, and we have several packs now that are very active uh, hunters and very active influencers of the ecosystem. Um, uh, these guys are territorial. So these are some, tra this is some tracking data um, from another uh, group uh, in um, another national park up in um, Minnesota and uh, evidence of really robust pack structure. These are social creatures, they hunt socially. And so this is evidence that they're doing good stuff. In California, we first, we, we eradicate, we you know, drove our wolves extinct by over-exploitation and poisoning. 
intentional overexploitation. And then uh, starting um, about uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, um, we had an individual, so some of these wolves dispersed to Southern Oregon, and then one of these wolves, uh, OR stands for Oregon, Oregon Collared Wolf 7 went into Northern California, and that was a huge deal. So that was the first time in almost a century we had um, wolves back in, wild wolves back in California. That was great. Um, by 2016, another individual had come all the way down and actually, and actually took up residence. Didn't just come for a little bit, but actually came and stayed. Um, then we have this Lassen pack, which I'll show you a video from in a second. And then the most recent news, does anybody remember this in May 2021? Anybody remember, remember that, that wolf story? You guys not paying attention? You guys were in the middle of the pandemic. So we had an individual get all the way down to Kern County, almost into Ventura County from Oregon, and then was hit by a car. So roadkill, right? Um, so the roadkill part sucks, but the fact that that wolf could go all the way, essentially almost down the entirety of the state of California is crazy and cool and suggests that if we have the right habitat and we're not overexploiting, these important predators can reestablish themselves uh, across potentially much of California. Um, and I'll just say Arizona, um, uh, a similar thing. Uh, so these guys are reestablishing in Arizona. Um, there's some controversy here where, um, where we're also trying to restore the Mexican wolf, which is a subspecies, which is a smaller bodied wolf, a more coyote size that really does well in the arid um, Southwest. The Mexican wolf extends from, from uh, New Mexico, Arizona, et cetera, down into most of their ranges in Mexico proper, the country of Mexico. Um, and, uh, and so now, now the wolves are starting to maybe, the gray wolves are starting to maybe um, get into contact with those Mexican wolves. And so that's, that's of concern. Um, yeah, I'll play that last impact video in a second. Okay, other examples of modern large bodied critters that we drove to extinction primarily from over harvesting include the stellar sea cow. So we had like our own manatee basically in Alaska and we exploited those guys, we, we, we over harvested them, again for oil, because we thought, hey, what's a better use of these guys, let's, let's, let's turn them into oil for a few years. And so we drove that species uh, to extinction in 1768. Um, the quagga, which is sort of like, is a, a, a terrestrial kind of um, like antelope type thing, in 1883. Thylacine, these guys right here. Um, uh, uh, 1936. Last individual, these are down in Australia, in Tasmania area. Um, Caribbean monk seal, 1952. Javan tiger, 76. This ibex in uh, 2000. And the black rhinoceros in 2011. So we are, this is a common phenomenon, right? And we've, we've done these, all these, by taking too many individuals, right? Um, from the natural population. Um, okay, so you guys tell me, give me some guesses. When could repeated removal of individuals from a population be sustainable? When do you think, when, yeah, is it? Oh, okay, that's a good idea, yeah, right, I hadn't thought about that, but sure, yeah. So if we have something that's not supposed to be here, maybe we can use over-exploitation to our favor, right? Cool, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So certainly with climate change, things like this, like we're not used to, so, so rainfall patterns are changing, et cetera. Um, we could have the case where, uh, where um, uh, we know it's going to be, it's a super dry year and we know there's not enough forage for these individuals. So maybe it's better to take out 10% of the population so they're not overgrazing the grass and not, not destroying all the, the forage, for example. So something like that. Okay, cool. What else? Or what are some other ideas? Max, give, give me an idea about uh, when, when could repeatedly taking individuals be, be an okay thing? So when is it like overpopulating an area and like mm -hmm. um, their presence is adversely affecting sure. their organisms or the ecosystem? Sure, good, good, good. 
the pulling of people into the visual. Okay, so maybe there's some, maybe there's some uh, like, uh, we were worried about COVID getting into some minks and stuff, so people like killed a bunch of minks, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Just one more question. By removal, you mean like, like kill it, or do you mean also? Like uh, for sake of argument, yeah, kill it. We'll say for sake of argument, kill it, sure. So, so this is what you guys were just talking about, right? So one is like if, if the current population size isn't really sustainable in the, in the current environmental conditions, so you guys just said that, right? So that, that, that's good. So knocking them down a little bit right now to keep their population rocking in the future kind of thing, right? Which might be counterintuitive, but, but maybe not be. Um, it's okay if we're, if we're harvesting and that population is stable, right? So if we're not taking so many that their numbers are going down, by definition, that is sustainable. That's a sustainable harvest, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean diseased or anything else. It could just be, let's take the right amount of individuals. Let's not take too many, right? Let's, let's, we can take individuals, but let's just not take more than whatever, 10% or whatever the, the number happens to be with the situation. And, uh, in general, as long as we're not hurting the ability to reproduce, this could be fine. So again, this is, this is so-called old style, maximum sustainable yield style thinking, but, um, but uh, nevertheless, as long as we have that growth, we could be okay. So you might be able to do something by maybe like um, controlling the predators of this species so that their babies survive more, so then it's okay for us to take more of them or something of that nature, right? And so, um, and that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about carrying capacity, right? So there's some level of carrying capacity up here that the, that the, that the ecosystem has. So we're starting here time zero, time something in the future, right? And the population is gonna grow initially very, very rapidly. And then as we approach uh, the carrying capacity, you guys might remember this from your intro bio class. This would be, this is, this is basic um, density dependent growth. Uh, uh, boom, 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 and then we stabilize. And then we have this number of critters in the population. And what we do when we're harvesting is we're knocking down this population, right? So we have, let's assume we're at this, this uh, carrying capacity, we harvest some, and this population goes down, then it recovers, down, it recovers. This is good, right? This, this would be a sustainable exploitation level. We're only taking a little bit, we're only taking this many, the difference between this amount. Um, not good is when we have a low number and we keep whacking it, whacking it, whacking it. This is also technically sustainable because the population isn't decreasing, but it's not, it's not allowed to get to its carrying capacity. So that would, be, that would be technically sustainable, but not desirable. Um, again, the, the challenge in our, modern, in our modern world is that frequently over-exploitation is, is, gets caught in this feedback loop and we don't often have a way to break that cycle. So it looks something like this. So here's price, here's how much we pay per, per individual or per pound or whatever. And this is the number of individuals harvested. We typically start off and we discover the organism. We don't harvest that many, we first find them and say, hey, these things taste really great. You guys should eat this fish. And, um, and we're not taking very many. The price is relatively high. And then we start harvesting more and more and more. They become a little more common, so the price drops. And we keep going, keep going, keep going. And then people are like, hey, let's, let's get, get even more. And this is still relatively stable. And then we enter the era of decline, right? And oftentimes, so now we're trying to get individuals and we can't get them. But now we've created an appetite or created a market for this, for this product or this, this meat or whatever it is. Um, and now people want more of it. They want more of it. So the price is going up because it's getting rarer, right? And then, and then this is often what happens is we just keep harvesting, 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 and we drive it to extinction. And rather than backing off when they become rare, um, our modern um, love of rarity tends to drive these things to um, extinction. Um, so the things that are most pr prone to overexploitation in today's day and age are things that are highly valuable, things that have fur, feather, or something really uh, attractive, visually attractive. You can also add on there, um, uh, one of the big major sources now are, are, are traditional medicines, particularly from Southeast Asia. 
and this assumption that you know a rhino horn will give you some kind of prowess in business or sexual prowess or something of that nature. So that's also apparent value, even though those things don't work at all for that stuff. But, but nevertheless, perceived value is a huge driver of overexploitation. Other critters that are prone are things that tend to clump up and tend to hang out in big chunks. So with, with, once we find them with modern technology, we can easily get a bunch of them at one fell swoop. Th those are prone to overexploitation. Critters that are very long lived, that have very slow turnover, very low generation time, or very long generation times, I should say. Um, and then critters that aren't in, th th that don't complete their life cycle within any one country. So these would be organisms that move between countries, transnational species, or species that exist outside of countries, so like in the open ocean. So those things are all those, those four things. If you, if you hit those, any of those, you should be worried. If you hit all four of those, there's, that's really, really, those, those critters are really, really imperiled or, or could well be imperiled. So value, gregariousness, slow growth, and, and outside of any one particular country. Um, yeah, okay, I already said that. So yeah, I already said that. So this is what I mean by, by the, tr the, the clumping, right? So uniform distribution is harder to get. Random is also harder to get. Clumped is relatively easy to get. Um, and that's what our, our stellar sea cows did. And that was one of the reasons why they were so easy to exploit. You just walk up and get a bunch of them at once. Um, low growth rate, a good example of this would be something um, uh, like our wandering albatrosses that are very long lived and don't necessarily have a baby every year. Similarly, things like our coast redwoods, only uh, the seeds they set only about 15% on, on average any one year are actually viable. So both of those are, are, have evolved to be very old individuals that reproduce slowly. That's bad in a context of overexploitation. Uh, and then things like uh, white sharks that migrate all around, all around the oceans um, and aren't in anybody's one, one person's territory. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and then things like uh, uh, red abalone. Um, so red abalone are, so we have seven species of abalone in, in California waters. The white abalone has the unfortunate distinction of being the first marine invertebrate listed on the Endangered Species Act. Um, uh, red abalone uh, are really problematic. Or actually, abalone in general are really problematic because they have broadcast spawning. So what do I mean by that? I mean, an individual sitting here on this rock to, to reproduce throws the eggs up in the water column and another individual throws sperm up in the water column and the hope is they fertilize and the hope is some of those eventually land, right? So for that to work, you can imagine in the ocean, if I took a turkey baser of, of sperm and squirted it in the ocean and then went 20 feet away and squirted some eggs, there's almost gonna be no probability of those eggs getting fertilized, right? To get fertilized, I need a male and female right next to each other, right? So when the eggs are released, the sperm are released and we're really in close proximity. The problem is now these individuals have been so overexploited. we still have individuals around, but their reproductive success is really crap because they need to be next to each other. So just because they're here, just because they're still around, I mean, that's better than being gone, but, but they're having a real tough time. And so we see um, a, a problem with those guys. In this case, these individuals need to be clumped, but, they're, but they're, they're, um, their numbers have gotten so low that they rarely are clumped these days. They used to be clumped a lot. Okay, then we're gonna end with talking about uh, international wildlife trade. So this is um, an example of some stuff and I'll just finish this up pretty quick, but just some, some, some scale of the problem. We're moving around something like uh, 25,000 primates a year, um, something like half a million birds a year, same number of reptiles. Um, uh, you know, uh, half a million fish uh, are moved around, uh, orchids, cacti, lots and lots of things are moved around in the international wildlife trade, a lot of things. Um, 
and and uh, so the value of just moving these this wildlife around is somewhere, and this is a few years, this is before COVID, so I don't know the current numbers, but somewhere on the order of five to, to ten billion dollars, what we're talking about, right? Um, and that doesn't include the the highly profitable things of fish and timber, which is about half a trillion dollars uh, a year in terms of uh, the value. Um, in the U.S., um, we're one of the biggest importers of orchids. We import something like 150 million orchids just to the U.S. each year, right? One of our largest shows in Santa Barbara, just up the street here, right? And, um, and that, that, is that was on hiatus since COVID. It's now back. Um, but nevertheless, uh, and I'm not implying that those people are doing something illegal, right? But I'm just saying there's a huge demand for these organisms that mostly come from the tropics and subtropics. Mm -hmm. Um, about 1.75 million uh, 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 reef building corals, uh, about 350,000 seahorses, um, and about 100,000 macaws, macaques. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so here are some, is some data um, in terms of what we do worldwide. So worldwide, we're moving around a half million primates around, and, and this is both uh, alive and dead. This is a, this the data is about a decade old, but gives you a sense of scale. Birds, about 3 million birds in any one year. Reptiles, about 15 million reptiles. People love snakes. Um, uh, fish for aquaria, um, about 4 million are moving around the planet. Similarly, for aquaria, about 2 million individual pieces of coral. Um, uh, uh, m tens of millions of orchids. This is less than I just um, just described for the U.S., um, but this is uh, this is an estimate from CITES, um, and about eight million cactus. Um, timber and seafood are the most important wildlife things we're trading. So wood products and seafood are the most important products we're moving around. Um, uh, and again, some of these numbers are different because I'm using different years data, but on the order of 200 billion for timber and 100 billion for, um, for fish. Um, and this is illegal. These numbers here are illegal trading of stuff, right? So these are things that should not be moving around. And so that's, you know, we're talking 300,000 birds shouldn't be moving around, um, millions of reptiles, uh, uh, T tens of tons of caviar, uh, mostly from sturgeon, um, which is an endangered fish. Um, uh, 20,000 hunting trophies. I, I want to say here, we've been talking about exploitation. It's important for me to make sure I say that hunting is not bad. Let me say that out loud again. Hunting and fishing is not bad. We're talking about over hunting and over fishing. Indeed, hunters provided have provided and still provide some of the greatest sources of resource, uh, greatest resources for conservation, right? Responsible hunting. Most hunters do not want to see no deer in the forest. They want to see deer in the forest, right? So don't think that any exploitation is bad, right? Um, it's, it's we do this um, trophy hunting to take the last elephant is the problem, right? Trophy hunting just because you want something on the wall of something that's endangered, that's the problem. Taking a gazillion million alligator as opposed to one or two alligator, those kinds of things. Okay? All right. And with that, um, I'll just say that dealing with the illegal trade, not the legal, but the illegal trade in wildlife is a key thing to try to deal with that over-exploitation that we've talked about. All this comes down to strict enforcement. The biggest problem I've seen with many of our conservation issues, particularly international things, um, but also national, uh, is we have a bunch of great rules. Are we enforcing them? The earthquake in Turkey a few years ago, a few uh, weeks ago, um, that killed several of my friends. Um, uh, they, Turkey has fantastic building codes, fantastic build, among the strongest in the world, as good as California, as good as Japan. It's enforcement, right? So these laws don't matter. If we don't have a way to enforce them, if, if they're just on the book somewhere, it doesn't matter. So one of the biggest issues with over-exploitation is, oops, I don't know what happened there. The biggest thing there is um, 
the biggest thing there is that we need to enforce stuff. Um, allowing illegal markets to, to flourish is going to encourage more, ever, oh, more over exploitation. And, and so that, that leads to illegal poaching, and that illegal poaching leads to more illegal poaching, and, and then we get in this bad um, uh, feedback loop. It's important to say that some of this stuff, particularly stuff related to bushmeat and some of these uh, illegal animal trading, are done by folks that don't have a lot of resources. So putting it solely on their backs as the, as the hunters or the people that do the actual harvesting, um, that's not necessarily right. It's very similar to drugs, right? In the sense that we need to talk about the whole cycle, not just the dealer or the, or the distributor, right? But that the, the consumer needs, we need to talk about the consumption of this and the desire for people to have these, these tissues and these substances as well. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so long, long term, finding true substitutes for these things is usually fantastic, right? So Viagra was fantastic for helping with some of the rhino poaching and stuff like that, right? Because people would, would one of the reasons they'd use the horn was for this aphrodisiac, this sort of sex drug kind of thing, right? So having true alternatives and substitutes are really, really helpful. In some cases, this is meat and protein. In some cases, it's other uh, uh, you know, products that would substitute for the building materials or whatever. But substitutes are really, really key and go a massive way in reducing the pressure and the demand that leads to the over-exploitation in the first place. And that's a really effective conservation strategy. Um, and, and we'll talk about this more, but, but one of the key things we have for international wildlife trade is this convention, which is the Convention on the International Trade of in, in Endangered Species. It was established in 1973, right around the same era, right? If you remember, this is our 1973, this is our Endangered Species Act. All this stuff comes at the same time. And essentially, we have a list in the US for what, what we consider an endangered species. This is, this is um, uh, uh, a list of species that are prohibited, that you can't ship anywhere ever, and then others that you can, but only with special permits, like say for a zoo or something of that nature. Um, and so CITES is the convention that we are a party to, that the US is a party to, that most major countries are. And so that's usually the international regulation that we use when we find a problem, we use the legal mechanisms built by CITES. CITES requires each country that's a signator to enforce its provisions. And it might be enforced in different, with different mechanisms in different countries, but the, every country has to enforce it. So CITES is the main thing we use to combat international wildlife trade and, over, and associated over-exploitation with those things. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat>